one of your. Okay. So he, here are five different uh, violas. Uh, four of them look sort of the same, but actually every single one is a little bit different. And then the fifth one here um, is, has the same ergonomic features as all the rest of these, but it looks a little bit more traditional. And that's for people who are like freelance players who are, are a little bit nervous about bringing in a different shape. Um, these three are different sizes. So this one here is the smallest one and it has the string length of a violin. It's very, 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 very short from here to here. Then this one is the equivalent of about a 15 and one quarter inch viola. And then this is the biggest one I make, which is still under 16 inches. It's about 15 and oh, about five eighths. Um, and then this one is the same size as that, but if you count carefully, there are five strings on that one. So that's, a, that's really more of a, a jazz instrument, although I have classical players who play those too. So let me explain a little bit ergonomically what I've tried to accomplish here. In order for a viola to sound, it obviously has to have a certain amount of um, interior uh, corpus space and it has to have a certain amount of vibrating area. But it does not necessarily have to be symmetrical. Uh, all, as long as you have enough air space inside and you have enough vibrating area, you can move, move the space around a little bit. And so that helps you um, when you're trying to play. So you play the chin on the left side, and when you're in fifth position and higher, then the hand is on the right side. So if you squeeze the instrument uh, from left bottom to right top and then stretch it in the opposite direction, then you get what you need in the way of the interior space and the vibrating surface. Um, but at the same time, it becomes much more comfortable to play. So that my stretch to first position is actually, I mean, on this instrument, it's only just slightly larger than on a violin. And then by shrinking this upper bout here to the size of a violin upper bout, then shifting up into the upper positions becomes very easy. Um, the main thing that this does, which helps musicians a lot, is what has happened, well, if you look on the end here, you'll see that this, uh, the thickness here, the width here, is completely different than the width on this side. And the whole instrument has been banked, as if you were in an if you were in an airplane making a banked turn. And what that allows is then the position of the fingerboard. So uh, if you were to play on a C string on a normal instrument on a normal viola, not only would your hand be out here somewhere, but you're torquing your elbow, called putting it in supine. That's the technical term for it. So that your elbow is way over, practically at your belly button. By banking the instrument here, the range of motion from the A string, you can see on my elbow, and here's the C string right here. And so that is incredibly comfortable and much healthier uh, uh, orthopedically uh, than it is on a normal instrument where you're way, way over here. It takes a little bit of getting used to because comparably your bow has to be a little bit, uh, well, it has to follow the same pattern. And so on your A string, you get, have to get used to playing the bow almost in a vertical position. That, that happens very quickly. And the cutaway of the corner here on the lower right bout is to allow your hand uh, more room there so that you're not, you know, uh, 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 catching uh, on, on that lower, lower right corner there. So that ergonomically is most of it. There were some things that had to be done uh, acoustically to make it, uh, to adjust it so that it, um, it worked again um, because most, most violin makers start the other way around. They say, okay, well, what do I need to do acoustically? And then we, I will build the corpus of the in instrument around the acoustics. I started exactly the opposite. I said, players are hurting, and so we need to build a corpus, and we need to build an instrument um, that doesn't injure them. And then the question is, okay, now we have one that's more comfortable, how do we get it to sound? 
Um, and so there were some things that, uh, that had to be done uh, to compensate for certain changes that got, got made in the instrument. And the first one is that the angle of the neck and the angle of the fingerboard is much, much higher uh, than it would be on, on a traditional instrument. And that, that you notice right away, the bridges are much higher. Um, and that's to allow for a greater angle going across the bridge which puts a little more tension into the instrument. Uh, the strings have a little more tension on them, um, but no more so than on a traditional viola. All you're doing is compensating for the fact that the string length is so much shorter on these. Uh, if the string length were longer on these, then you'd want that bridge lower. Um, but in this particular case, because, this, because the strings are so short, you need, need to add that back into the instrument, and that's, that's what's happened there. And then because the angle of the fingerboard is so much higher, it means the bridges are a lot taller. And f at first there were all kinds of problems with the bridges warping because uh, they just couldn't withstand that, that the, the, the correct pressure now, but, but with the bridge much higher to achieve that pressure. And so if you look carefully, you'll see that the bridges are laminated. There's a, a sort of a black line or a very dark line right in the middle of the bridge going from top to bottom. Um, and that is a piece of actually the, the, the two lighter pieces on the outside of the instrument. Those are traditional maple. The one in the middle is mesquite wood. And after much, much experimentation, that was the wood that acoustically was the most advantageous to the bridges. Um, and not only was it acoustically advantageous, but actually these bridges sound better than the ones that are made of just maple. And so that was, uh, I, I did it again mostly for the ergonomics of it um, and for the, the structural support of it. Uh, but then it turned out that it, it was acoustically um, viable and advantageous too. So the only other thing to say is um, ebony is in trouble and so these fingerboards are not made of ebony. They are a synthetic uh, which is uh, acoustically works very well. Um, so we're trying to save a few uh, trees on Madagascar. And then on the newer versions um, this isn't the case with all of them, the older ones. Uh, for example, this is an older, older one and it has uh, traditional pegs. But on the newer ones here that are on the table, um, these are these wonderful uh, um, mechanical pegs. Um, and you'll notice there's not even any fine tuners on this. You don't need them. Even on a violin E string, you don't need them with these, with these pegs. They, they are truly wonderful. So that, um, you can take a picture of this. This is, the <laughs> there's, there's my friend, we call him Luciano because he looks like he's Mr. Pavarotti trying to sing. Um, this is the one instrument that, I, I, of the five here that is actually not for sale, but I wanted, to, it's the only one I have right now in this size. And so I wanted you to have the opportunity. This is the one that, that's the size of a violin when, when you play it. And these do come up they are occasionally for sale. And so... Uh, and do so I understand correctly you're not making them anymore? Um, that supporting? is correct. I, I am semi-retired. So I, I'm, uh, I, I am brokering them. As you can see, there are, there are lots here and probably half of those are on consignment. Um, and, uh, and I will continue to repair and I will continue to, um, uh, to service them um, and then act, as I say, as, as an agent for those who care to sell or to buy them. So, uh, but no, I'm not making any new ones now. <laughs> Okay, um, just a couple uh, words about the, the shoulder rests. Um, if, if you look carefully at that shoulder rest, that's a typical Mach 1. That's one that's uh, commercially available, but uh, uh, Peter Mach makes these especially for, for me. Um, and so that's one of the two r really popular models of shoulder rest. Uh, the other one being uh, the Kuhn shoulder rest. Um, and basically what, what happens with those is I just simply alter them myself. So you use a regular Kuhn shoulder rest and then, uh, uh, and then I add a little extension there. Um, and then the other thing that I get asked a lot about is cases. 
Um, there are two models of cases. Well, in this particular instrument, you, you can use a traditional case. That doesn't require anything special. Um, but in the Pellegrina model, there are two. There's, there was the first one that we came up with, which, which is an oblong case, room for four bows and, you know, music pocket, and then the, uh, an, I mean, uh, an accessory pocket inside the case, and then a zippered music pocket uh, in the lid of the case, just, just like a, a, a traditional uh, viola case. But with the size of the corpus of these instruments, which is, by the way, larger than a traditional viola, um, those cases get pretty heavy. Um, and so after a while, we found a, a maker that, um, a, a case maker, um, who makes a, a shaped case, uh, took three pounds off the weight of the, uh, of the case, uh, the, the original case. And um, I thought, well, it's, gee, you know, these are a little bit funky looking, but players love them. Uh, they're, they're light and they, you know, you can't carry your music in the pocket and so forth, and, uh, but, but they are so much easier on your back. So they're, they're two different models. So. Great. Thank you very much. Sure.